Good evening and welcome to our panel discussion of Black Men in White Coats. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We at St. Mary's County Library are delighted to be hosting it. I'm Michael Blackwell, Director of St. Mary's County Library. A quick reminder to everybody, the library is opening its doors for browsing the stacks on Monday the 8th. Uh, while computer use and drive up service will remain available, we hope to be open even more fully later in the year as the COVID uh, pandemic learning left releases its script. I'd like to start by thanking our partners this evening, um, Calvert Library, Charles County Public Library, St. Mary's County Public Schools, Historic Sodderly, NAACP Chapter 7025 here in St. Mary's, the Partners in Dismantling Racism and Privilege, also known as the Big Conversation, the Howard County Library System, the Carroll County Public Library System, and also the United Committee for African-American Contributions. Uh, thank you for partnering with us. I'm gonna introduce our panelists this evening and also our moderator. Our moderator is Kelsey Bush. Um, Kelsey is a native of Lexington Park in St. Mary's County. He attended county public schools here and graduated from Great Mills High School. He earned a Bachelor uh, of Arts degree from St. Mary's College of Maryland with dual majors in political science and sociology and anthropology. He also earned a Juris Doctorate from the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. He's currently the Interim Chief Diversity Officer at St. Mary's College of Maryland. And if you're from St. Mary's County, Kelsey needs no introduction. He's just been so involved with our community that um, uh, it's, you know, in inspiring to see all he does. Um, our, our introduce in more or less alphabetical order here. Our first uh, panelist will be um, Dr. Chael Aho Gotu. Um, he's currently the Vice President of Medical Affairs and the Chief Medical Officer at MedStar Southern Hospital, uh, where he has served in that role since 2016. He received his medical degree at the University of Nigeria and completed his urological residency at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. He's also completed an American Cancer Society Urology Oncology Fellowship. He has served in numerous leadership roles, including President of Howard University Medical and Dental Staff, Chairman of our Howard University uh, Faculty Practice Plan, Physicians of Advisory Council, and the President of the Washington Urological Society. Um, welcome. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Atimo is the orthopedic surgeon at MedStar St. Mary's Hospital, Leonardtown. He's completed his orthopedic surgery residency at Temple University Hospital. And in June of 2013, he's also completed an orthopedic sports medicine fellowship at MedStar Union Memorial in Baltimore. And in July of 2016, he became board certified in general orthopedic surgery. Um, he has had extensive athletic team experience with coverage of various high schools and colleges. And this has included coverage of Temple University's football team, the local high schools university in Baltimore and the Baltimore Ravens and Washington Nationals uh, teams. Um, Dr. Joyce Neal is joining us this evening. Uh, she's a lifelong Connie resident here. She's completed medical school and her obstetrics training at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. Prior to entering a residency in obstetrics and gynecology, she completed an internship in internal medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. She represents the third generation of the Neal family to work in St. Mary's Hospital, preceded by her father, James Neal, who worked in the lab, and her paternal grandmother, Estelle, who is a housekeeper in the hospital. So we've got a real family tradition going here. Um, she was administrative chief resident during her final year. It was at the urging of her father to come back to the county to president, um, practice medicine instead of accepting a job offer to stay at the University of Maryland as a general OBYGN. Um, she began her practice at St. Mary's Hospital on July 8, 1996, as he continued to serve the needs of the county. And thank you to your father for convincing you that this is the place you need to work. We're, we're very fortunate to have you here. Um, yes, we are. Yes, Dr. Namdi Davis um, has practiced obstetrics and gynecology and medicine for over 20 plus years in the Southern Maryland area. He currently works with Women's Health Associate with St. Mary's MedStar Hospital in Leonardtown. Such a distinguished panel, we're very fortunate to have them here. Kelsey, please take it away. Thank you, Michael, for the wonderful introductions. Um, right now, I just wanna look back at the film. And the film is taking a snapshot of, of our history at the present time or, or 2014, but it's indicative of the time period now. And the lack of black males that are present in the medical field Thinking back to the film and also thinking towards your experiences, 
what was the first thing you thought about when you saw it? And how does that relate to the experiences that you have had throughout your careers? Anyone can answer that. Who, who would like to start? Um, I'll start. I was shocked at the number. Um, I really didn't realize um, that Black men were so underrepresented. I, I recognize that African Americans in general are underrepresented in medicine, but I, I think I myself had a, have a little bit of a tunnel vision because I work with Dr. Davis and I see this Black man frequently four to five times a week. So it, it was almost out of my realm of consciousness that um, out in the vast world, we really, um, we're truly underrepresented. And the film really makes me want to delve into why is that and what we can do? Because I do think it's important for people of color to see themselves represented in the medical community. Thank you. Hi, this is like Billy. To... Oh, go oh. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to piggyback off of what she had said, which is the same thing. Asked why, you know, like I, for me, it wasn't surprising um, because especially when I go to a meeting or a conference anywhere, I always look at around the room and I'm maybe one of only or of a few out of hundreds or thousands. So it's not, you know, uh, unusual. And the question always is why? And um, I ask myself, uh, how do I get to where I am today? Um, and there's just a variety of reasons, but also how can I encourage other people to, you know, to take that step forward and better yet put their best foot forward? Because I think that's kind of really important um but it, it, they 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 brought about a lot of different reasons and a lot of different ideas and whose fault and all this thing and I, and I think you know you can't really point a finger I think everybody has to answer that question internally and say well how best can I contribute and can we change things you know it, it's just it, it was a very thought-provoking movie and, and film. I mean, I really, it was something that I knew existed. It's something that I knew was a problem, but it just explained it and showed it from so many different aspects that really, you know, made me just pause and take a step back and say, okay, what were my challenges? What were my impediments? And how did I overcome them? Thank you. Yeah, I was going to jump in and, um, you know, my, my exact sentiments, um, you know, as um, uh, having the opportunity of working uh, as an academic urologist for, for many years um, in the College of Medicine at a uh, historically black college, um, I was aware um, and am aware of um, the discrepancy of uh, or the paucity of um, African-American men uh, getting into, first of all, applying for medical school and then actually getting into medical school. So that's always been a challenge. Um, it, it's, it's just striking uh, the, the, the few numbers of African-American uh, male applicants uh, to, to medical schools, including historically black medical schools. Um, yeah, I, I think that what was really striking for me in this, um, um, in this uh, uh, movie was just you know, connecting the dots about sort of being able to visualize being an African-American physician and how many or how few uh, young black boys actually have contact or any kind of access with um, uh, African-American uh, physicians, um, not to speak of just access with the healthcare system, which is another uh, conversation altogether. But um, so the model of trying to um, you know, visualize or, or create a mechanism for visualizing um, um, young black boys as, Af as, as, as physicians is a very, very interesting concept. And, um, and I think that the way that they're going about Dr. Dale and, 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 and the whole movement makes a whole lot of sense to me. It was very inspiring uh, to, 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 to listen to the testimonies and to also um, 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 be aware that a movement like this is growing in our country. Dr. Davis, you can't hide. I can't hide. I don't want to hide. <laughs> um, from, 
from my perspective, to me, it's one of um, personal history and the history of our country. And um, I merged the two together thinking of when I first went to medical school and I went to medical school in Louisville, Kentucky. And um, as the other doctors can recall, the first two years are in the classroom, the third and fourth year are in the hospital. So those first two years you're in the classroom, you're really separated from the hospital. And at our medical school, the first and second year um, classrooms were lined with pictures of the previous graduates of the medical school. And obviously my medical school went back over a hundred years. And obviously there were just hardly any black faces on the wall until our school decided to go through a change. And when I met a lot of my classmates, they either had family or friends who were in the medical profession. So historically we've had a problem and then the, it's an issue of mentorship because they would say my father was a doctor or um, someone in my family worked in the hospital. So someone helped guide, um, had to guide them along the way. In terms of barriers, all right, the other barrier we didn't speak about is just the cost of going to medical school. I'm not trying to scare anybody away, but um, when I went to medical school, it was relatively cheap. I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying what it, what it cost, but it was really, really cheap in comparison to what I hear people pay nowadays. So if you don't have someone mentoring you at an early age, if you don't have some some way of financially making through medical school, those are just really huge, huge, huge barriers. And Dr. Davis, I, mm -hmm. I can say when it comes to law school, mm -hmm. it's about the same thing too, because that was my similar experience going into law school was, you know, looking around and being the first, you know, in my family to, to venture forth to college and venture forth onto something along those lines. And you're standing there with people who's, this is the family business you know, whose parents are judges, who, whose parents have, you know, and we're not just talking like dad, we're talking dad and mom, you know, and, you know, they had talks of logic around the table. It's like, we may have talked politics, but not to that degree. So you already have that feeling of being behind the eight ball. Did any of you experience that, like, through, like, maybe through your, your early education or into, you know, college and medical school, you know, that feeling of, is there a slight imposter, not imposter syndrome, but that feeling of angst of, um, do I belong? You know, not just the fact of visually, but also intellectually that additional pressure because of, because of maybe, because of the fact that other individuals may have that already that starting out of the starting gate, you know, about 10 leagues up. So I have a different perspective because I come from a family of doctors. I'm the last of last of five kids. My dad's an OBGYN, and there are three other doctors. Okay, an interventional cardiologist, a urologist, and a hospitalist internist. And I'm worth being certain the last. And so, the path forward to med school for me wasn't straight at all, because I didn't want to go to med school. I saw my family was a bunch of doctors. That exposure when I was watching the film. I asked myself, why was it so hard for me? If exposure is key, because the drive has to come from within. Yeah. And that was the, so one of the best things one of the guys said was, his mom said, do the best because your name is attached to it. And my scholarship program, which was the Meyerhoff scholarship program at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, told me, fight the urge to be average. Fight mediocrity. And that was the battle that I had through a lot of college and high school. And part of it was my surroundings. You know, I were around a bunch of other people who didn't care about academics, cared about sports. So the fact that I couldn't play basketball the best, I wasn't playing football, I didn't have the newest Air Jordans, all that stuff made a difference. And of course, when you're growing up, that weighs so much more on you than your parents telling you, oh, you'll be fine, don't worry about them, you have your books and all those things. So it made it really, really challenging. And I have to say, for me, personally speaking, you know, the foundation was laid there because of, yes, my parents were around, my siblings were around, I was already in a scholarship program. And though academically I struggled, I had a lot of people putting things in place for me to succeed. I, I was doing summer programs, internships, all these things that helped me make it into med school. But, you know, nothing changed until it came from within. 
And so I had a lot of angst. I had questions, do I belong? And I had to ask myself, you know, is this for me? Because, and I, it wasn't that I didn't think I was smart enough, but that I want to do this. Is this the life that I want to lead? lead? And is it going to change who I was internally? So when I watched the movie again, and I saw the scope of African-American doctors and how they're all different, that was one of the things that helped me out, particularly when I went to med school, was that, you know, I kind of understood that you could be you, whichever you that is. And as long as you do, you do well, you put your best, your best foot forward, you're going to succeed in some way or form. You may fail once, you may fail twice, but you keep trying, you know, to achieve that, that goal. And I think once I kind of understood that, and again, surrounded myself, so I went to Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, and I was surrounded by other minorities who were just like me. I was like, oh, you play basketball, you lift weights, you do all these things. Oh, you're the only one to go to college? Okay, you have a bunch of doctors. I mean, I saw the whole mix of everything, you know, those who came from, from, from money, those who didn't have money, those who came from all these different things. But we were all like-minded in the goal that we wanted to be doctors. And that gave me peace of mind and made me say, you know what? I do belong, you know, but until then, I mean, that was the hardest thing was just figuring out, you know, you've got all these people, because again, it wasn't a question of, am I smart enough? I just felt like I was going to lose myself in following that path, or I had to change or become something I didn't want to do. And it took me a while to understand that it is something I want to do, and I have no regrets about doing it. And there's so many people who you meet, and they're, you know, I've always wanted to do this. You know, some of the people, even in the movies, it's just... They had that focus and driven. And I wish I had that when I was younger, but I certainly didn't. So again, when I asked myself the question, why? You know, I asked myself, why was it so hard? You have everything around you. You have so many positive influences to, to show you the way. Why was it so hard for me to follow that path? You know, and at least for me, I think a lot of it just had to do with my surroundings. You know, my school yeah. environment, those who were around with me. Because again, when you're a teenager, whatever your parents say is not as important as what your friends say. You know, it, it's a huge difference. Sometimes it's hard to be an individual. You know, it's easier to follow the crowd. We've got a lot of mics open, so who wants to go first? I think something else he, he emphasized um, is the issue of starting early. Um, this is a kind of vocation, sort of profession, where yes, you can join it late, but a, a lot of people whom I saw in medical school had decided to become a doctor, again, as you said, because of family, because of friends, and they made that decision early on in life. That's another issue. Yeah. You know, one of the, um, going back to, um, to uh, Dr. Atiemo's uh, comment about um, sort of different pathways. Um, so, so for me, um, you know, I, um, you know, I, 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 my parents are both Nigerian. I was born and raised here. So I, I was always exposed to the importance of education, not necessarily medicine per se, um, but um, I ended up um, going to an HBCU for undergrad and then going to um, a medical school in Nigeria. So I always, you know, were around a lot of um, black, intel intelligent uh, students, folks who were aspiring to be doctors and lawyers and other professionals. So I, I think that that exposure was not as much of a challenge for me. The biggest challenge during my medical career uh, was really during residency, uh, because when I uh, had uh, returned from Nigeria, I was fortunate enough to get um, a residency in Iowa. But I was the only black resident in, um, in my program and probably one of only two or three black residents in the whole hospital. And, and I struggled. I mean, it, it just being able to relate, uh, being able to um, uh, not feel so isolated. And, you know, and everybody was great. Everyone was supportive. And, but, but just not feeling totally part of that group was a real challenge for me. And so I can imagine, you know, you know, when we talk about um, the challenges with getting um, African-American physicians who go all the way through the process of, you know, first of all, um, you know, being interested in becoming a physician, um, going through the rigors of being prepared to take the standardized exams, getting through those standardized exams, 
uh, going through the, um, the admissions process, which is another huge barrier. And then after that, um, getting through medical school. Uh, again, if you're isolated, that could be a challenge. And then getting through residency can be a challenge. And all of those different steps, I think, filter out African-American men for a variety of reasons. And, and so um, looking for ways to support um, black men through that entire journey is a really important part of uh, being able to get more um, uh, black men um, to, uh, to be part of the physician workforce. Dr. Neal? Yeah. I, I was just thinking one of the things um, that struck me in the movie, and I think we all know it, is little black boys from elementary school they're, they're treated differently, almost written off from the beginning. You know, the expulsion rates, the, the um, punishments are more extreme. And so I'm wondering how do we even educate teachers? And I'm sure the biases, maybe some of them are on purpose, but not. How do we get people to look at our little black boys right from early on to recognize their value. By the time, you know, boys are getting to sixth, seventh grade, they've already been labeled. And when you don't expect much of people, I think a lot of times they don't deliver. So I, I, I'm fortunate I have a nephew who um, wants to um, become an orthopedic surgeon. Um, don't know why I didn't wanna choose OB, but um, <laughs> because he saw me. And, you know, we, from when he was a little boy, I've, you know, always expected, not expected him to be a doctor, but to do well in school. You come from, you know, good stuff. You are capable of doing, you know, whatever. And our whole family has been that way. But I know for his one example, there are hundreds of little black boys who don't have anybody expecting that of them. And by the time I think we're getting to high school, middle school, uh, the, I hate to say the die is almost cast, but I feel like it's almost cast. And I'm just wondering, how do we stop that? How do we change the beginning so that our boy, our little boys are lifted? And that's a great question. And I, I think that's a question that you know, can be asked in a, in a multitude of spaces. I mean, Stanford, there's a Stanford University study that was done on um, pre-K, pre preschool aged individuals. Um, more or less what it was, was a a um, you know, professor was at a pre-K conference where a video was shown to participants. They're all pre-K teachers. And more or less, they're told that there are four students, two black, two white, one you know, male and female. Long story short, they're told something's wrong in this video. The kids are doing something wrong. Uh, please indicate you know, who's doing what, write it down on a piece of paper. Well, it was not an ethical test because the actual thing that they were doing is doing eye tracking, not so much the actual video. The kids were doing exactly the same thing. No matter who, black, white, Asian, Latinx, everyone's eyes watched the black children more and they commented <laughs> more on the black children which gets into that, that sort of you know, question of, you know, how much does you know, our own biases, as, you know, as you said, Dr. Neal, play a part in derailing you know, so, sort of these dreams? You know, because we look at the numbers from the 1970s to now, and we look and go, what was the difference? Well, we, the first immediate difference is that's the beginning of desegregation. So what do you have more of in the school system, which are African-American teachers coming in from a segregated system, including administrators and things along those lines. But how are our school systems now? How do they look? Is the support there in, to, in that cultural understanding the same way? Are those individuals there to be those mentors to go, look, I know your family. I know the way you're supposed to act. Look, stop being loud. Get your butt back to the books. You know, is that the question we're dealing with right now is the fact that, you know, as much as we're, we're diving into, you know, medical school, but what is it about that pipeline that's being built up? Like, you know, your nephew, he's, he's got you. He's got a very supportive family. But what about, you know, 
those that may not, as you said, have that supportive family? What if, it, what if it's a situation where they have a supportive family, but there's labels that are placed on them, like, like there's, or, or papers put out there. What can we do to kind of sort of twist that system? How can we, how can we help out there to show like, hey, this is a pipeline. I know that's a bomb of a question. And if you guys can answer that, I think we can take this on the road and solve many, many a problem. So does anyone really want to walk in that direction and say, how do we build that pipeline even earlier and put that expectation of success and dreams forward, not just in the sense of the field of entertainment and athletics, but also in academics? Well, one, one thing I would advocate is, again, the issue of mentorship of every variety. And um, I just want to give a vignette that will, that will prove my point. Um, when I lived in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and I was in college, and I knew I wanted to go to medical school. Um, I didn't have a car, and I had to take the bus. And it's a story I sometimes tell my patient. And I could not take the bus directly home. And I had to sometimes go to you know, one of the central bus locations to do a transfer. I'm setting the story up to, to, make, to, to make my issue about mentorship. And one of the transfer points was at um, the city of Louisville, they had a Federal Reserve Bank. It just so happened one of the guards at the bank, um, I knew, and I knew him because he went to my grandfather's church. And when he got off of work, sometimes he and I would ride the bus home together. And he knew I wanted to go to medical school. And when I got off the bus, you know, as we rode home, he says he always gave me encouragement. He didn't know much about medical school. He didn't know you know really how to get in, but he gave me encouragement. So to me, the issue of getting back to something that I think Dr. Timo might have said about his his younger days, it's an issue of think of your a black male growing up, and someone's always asking you, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" Or I think you can be this when you grow up. That type of positive encouragement would let a young black male do anything he wants to do besides trying to be Michael Jordan. So to me, the issue gets back again to mentorship and who's encouraging you. It doesn't just have to be a doctor. It could be anybody who says, I think you can do this. And that's what he did with me when we rode home the bus every now and then. He says, I think you can do this. And he always encouraged me, he always looked at me. And he was just a bank guard at the Federal Reserve Bank. So Dr. Neal also spoke about the environment that you're around. So even if the environment's bad, as long as someone's telling you, I think you can do this, when you're age, when you're in the sixth grade, seventh grade, that gets into your head and you think, yes, I can do this because we know these kids can succeed. We know the black male can succeed because we've seen stories of them like out on the basketball court and I didn't think I can make this free throw and guess what, I could do it. So the, this way of thinking that we can overcome, we can achieve is a part of all of us. That's just exactly what I was thinking about when um, I was thinking about what resonates in you. You know, I had done outreach in med school before we went to some uh, some of the impoverished communities and we spoke to the youth and the kids. And I thought about myself again, not that I was impoverished, but just that though I fought against education, the advice that was given to me was ingrained in me. Such that when I finally accepted it, I already told what to do and how to succeed. I just needed to follow through with those actions. And so by you know as they said if you can if you can see it you can be it by mentorship by exposing by talking to kids and said putting your best foot forward i tell all my patients who come to me i say hey how are your grades how are your books you know have something to fall back on you know i mean sports are very good don't get me wrong i mean sports are very 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 good but your brain will never fail you you can tear an acl you can break a bone you can do a lot of things but your brain is never going to fail you and so I encourage all my kids, you know, and, and even I'm thinking about my son as we talk is because I'm always like, how do I get him to put his best foot forward in everything he does? Every single thing he does, not just running, who could be the fastest, but in everything you do. And like the, like the, the mother told the uh, young doctor said, you know, I think he was an ex NFL player. Do it because your name's attached to it. <laughs> That's, you know, be the best because your name, this is representing you. And as, as you said, that, that mentorship key and somehow talking to the kids, no matter what, because not everybody's going to be a doctor. Not everybody's going to be a lawyer or a scientist, but no matter what you do, do it well. I meet so many people in the hospital of so many different stations, and I appreciate every single one of them. 
because of the work and the effort they put into it. Whether it's a doctor, whether it's somebody's cooking, whether it's cleaning, anything, when they do it and they do it well, you know, I mean, it makes a huge difference. And, and I think, and, and all of us, you know, if we can get our kids to strive to be the best at the matter what it is, again, fight the urge to be average, fight the urge to be mediocre. And, you know, by them seeing us, all different aspects of us, you know, you know, we're all different colors, different shapes, different sizes, different attitudes, different personalities, then hopefully it instills in them the thought that that could be me. Not everybody's going to get it, but hopefully some will, and that will help. Yeah, I, would, I would totally agree with that. I, I think mentorship is, is key. And, and I think that the medical schools have to take a different approach to their um, role in, uh, in grooming minority um, physicians and, and, um, and other healthcare providers. Um, you know, the, obviously the, um, the opportunity to connect with the community, um, provide um, opportunities for uh, young folks to um, come in contact with um, with aspiring and um, aspiring provider aspiring physicians and, and established physicians is important, uh, but I think another piece of this, and they they touched on this in the in the movie, is around the admissions process. Um, you know, the admissions process is often driven by the uh, standardized uh, results of the MCAT scores. Um, you know, there's a lot of pressure institutionally uh, for medical schools to use this as sort of a measure of, um, of quality, a measure of high performance. Uh, and um, they often uh, overlook uh, some of the other important aspects of, uh, of being a great physician, compassion, empathy, um, your ability to communicate effectively, um, your ability, you know, emotional intelligence, all of those things are often not factored in, uh, at least not factored in as uh, as um, as as much as the as the scores and and some of that has to do with the business of medicine. Um, you know, um, it, often your ranking, uh, 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 your your reputational uh, uh, position as a medical school is driven often by uh, the average uh, MCAT scores, um, and so that whole paradigm has to change. And I think that's going to be an important part of that because. Um, not only will we uh, get more um, diversity in the medical community, but I think that we'll get better quality physicians as well. You're so correct in what you said, because um, the year I went into medical school, the medical school went on a big push to get in minority students. And it seemed as if, oh, they did a good job out of 120 maybe entering into the first year class, maybe 10 were black. And it seemed as if once they got us in, that was it for them. Granted, I understand they have a lot of other priorities, but what you said was so true. And the other thing that you said was true too, is this, like you said, the overwhelming or avalanche really of hurdles you have to overcome just to get in and to stay in. And it was just something I wasn't used to, something nobody spoke to me about. We're just taking exam after exam after exam, standardized exam, you just bombarded, bombarded from it. And the most important thing I want to take you back onto what you said, the person who enters medical school is nowhere near that same person who's at the end of their residency program. And there's a zero correlation between your character or who you are or how smart you are or anything about you when you enter that first year of medical school to the kind of position you will end up as. It's just none at all. It's the things that happen to you along the way. If you said, I remember one of the smartest persons in our class went into psychiatry. That's all he wanted to go into. I remember some people who were really, really smart who got um, into good residency programs they just quit after a while. We heard the stories of that. There's this zero correlation and the medical schools know that. But I understand as you're saying, so many things are tied to this type of thing just as things are tied to us in medicine nowadays to a number. And as numbers don't represent, as you said, the, the, the character of the physician or the quality of work that you're doing. So I just wanted to wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying because you brought back a lot of memories. Dr. Neal. Thank you. you know, I just, I was there thinking, um, it's hard to know who, who, to me, who can change those things. And I just wish um, the governor, for instance, I mean, we're talking about this pandemic and, you know, this state of emergency. To me, this is a state of emergency. You have a lot of vaccine hesitancy because, you know, people of color have not had a great relationship with 
the medical establishment. And if there were more uh, persons of color to push that, maybe we wouldn't be where we are or where we're gonna be in a few months. And it would be nice if there was some way um, that Dr. Hogan, uh, I mean, Governor Hogan could convene a committee, you know, the, the status of the African-American male and medicine, and let's do something about it and partner with these, you know, medical schools, you know, because it, it doesn't have to be that your MCAT score is what gets you into, you know, medical school. And it, I would certainly love to speak with him, you know, on, on the phone and say, this is, this is a problem that needs to be addressed just as much as getting these vaccines into, you know, the arms of, of people. Or I wish there was a black professional society. Like I said, I get to see Dr. Davis all the time, but I don't see Dr. Timu. I, I know when he's on the OR schedule and I'm passing, you know, through, but I never see, I've never met, you know, you. It would be nice if there was a society of Black professionals that we could, you know, get together and, and try to accomplish, you know, some of these things. Mentor, you know, some of the kids who don't have, you know, mentors um, otherwise. I certainly myself would be interested um, yeah. And that, you know, I'm not a black male, but to support. Uh, on my job, as Dr. Deal alluded to, I don't get to see males at all. But uh, sometimes um, prior to the age of COVID, the, um, some of the mothers would bring in their sons. And I do see a lot of young women. And one thing I always, always, always do with my young patients, and one thing we always did when I was in a solo practice or a small group practice, they know we gave them a lot of time. Not a lot of time for the exam, not always a lot of time to talk about GYN issues, but to talk about life issues. And one thing I always said to the, my young kids when I saw them in the office, I said, don't ever give up, don't ex ever accept no as an answer. I don't know the results of saying those things, but I know the results of people telling me things like that. So if I had other mentors, like you said, the, the man who was a guard at the bank, or my grandfather, or my father, or I telling me don't give up, I know if I keep telling that to other young people, at least one of them is not going to give up. So I agree we should have these panels. And to tag on to what Dr. Neal said, it shouldn't just include male doctors, male nurses, you know, black male nurses, yeah. other black males who are in the health profession. Because I think with more numbers, it looks like we have more power, more force. Or even just black male professionals, period. In the sense yeah. of in, in things beyond what, what are considered the typical things. Because you think about it, me having a JD, if I went into private practice, I'd be one of two black attorneys in St. Mary's County. That's a shame. I mean, you know, you think about that, and I would be mm -hmm. the, the black male attorney in St. Mary's County. That's the that's the thing. It's just the image of even if you have the education and you're not doing it, it's the fact that you've done it. And to give a plug to you know, the institution that pays my uh, salary now, um, St. Mary's College, like a lot of colleges, I wonder if, the, if um, hospitals and universi you know, universities and colleges when it comes to their med schools could go like we have, which is test optional for mm. the MCAS, and look at other aspects of the person's background to bring them in to kind of try to diversify the individuals that are coming in. Because is that you know I I've never taken an MCAT I don't know what the MCAT looks like I just know what you know that that it's over there you know <laughs> all my friends that decided to go to the med school that I knew it was over there but would that be a you know it doesn't really weed out, it doesn't seem like it's really weeding out anyone it just seems like it's an additional barrier more so than your actual ability to do the work or to be successful. Is, you know, is there a different way to be that gatekeeper per se, to get to not dis, you know, dissuade individuals, especially black males from getting into medical school? Yeah, I think uh, it's on its way because they're, I think in uh, two or three years, they're getting rid of step one and step two. It's in terms of, it's just gonna be like a pass fail. Those were in residence and medical school, excuse me, are very, very important in terms of determining, you know, where you go and potential get into residency and everything. Uh, for those competitive programs, those were highly regarded, just like the MCAT. And in my own personal experience, I had um, somebody tell me up front, you know, we would accept you and we would take you, except your MCAT score needs to be one point higher. <laughs> we like everything about you, but if your 
kind of score was one point higher, we, you know, we'd accept you today. We, we know your family, we know your history, we know everything about you guys and what you're capable of, but your score is just down by one more point. And I was like, wow, <laughs> if I just had one more point from this test, you know, I would have gone to this school, but uh, God works in mysterious ways and I would not be where I am if I had gone there. So mm-hmm. I have no regrets about that. Uh, but as I said, you know, the numbers, you're right. I mean, the MCAT, there's so many reasons why people struggle with the MCAT and some excel. Again, access is really key. Going to uh, courses, classes, um, um, having the resources to prepare for the test is, is a huge difference versus somebody who doesn't have any resources. It's really hard to prepare for on your own if you're just going to buy some books off the shelf and <laughs> think you're going to take the test. There's a strategy to taking the test, but I think if they're, they're kind of fading it out of med school, so I imagine in the next couple of years or so, they may get rid of the MCAT as well. Yeah, there's definitely a movement. And um, the American, um, the Association for American Medical Colleges, uh, AAMC, uh, has, as you know, they put out the, um, the seminal paper in 2015, uh, really highlighting this um, disparity. Um, and, um, and I think that um, there is a growing um, uh, sort of um, movement uh, among academic uh, medical uh, institutions to to do major reform on how they and on how they do admissions. Uh, so so that's great news. I think it's one piece of the puzzle because as you know, there's so many other pieces of the puzzle. The National Medical Association uh, does a lot of work in trying to bring um, African American uh, medical professionals together um, to collaborate to um, uh, work on projects that um, uh, many of which uh, are focused on grassroots efforts to uh, increase visibility of, um, of people of color involved in um, the medical profession. Uh, so uh, those are d- definitely resources that are available. Um, as Dr. Neal was mentioning, uh, some options of how to, um, you know, build networks uh, and and uh, uh, get together with folks who are like-minded and willing to. Uh, put their time into uh, addressing some of these issues. That, that I think that's a great resource. I worked with the NMA for many, many years, and um, they're always a very uh, good resource for that kind of work. Thank you. I, I, the other thing that, that pops in my head is even when we look at demographic information, and you know, it's called the Browning of America, isn't that it, doesn't it behoove us to really put together a concerted effort to bring black males in with the changing demographics of, of America as a whole? Um, because Dr. Neil, you touched on it when it came to the whole aspect of trust within the medical field and the lack of representation because of that lack of trust, especially right now we're seeing it with the, the rollout of the vaccine. Um, you know, because in some communities, you know, even possibly including, you know, ours here in Southern Maryland. There are, there are individuals that may not get it because they don't feel as safe as if it was something coming from someone that looked like them. How do we really take that concerted effort to really, to really push in that direction, to push ourselves as community and otherwise? How do we develop something to create that pipeline to, um, to possibly identify young men early, early on to, you know, get them into programs like STEM as, as in the public school system here in St. Mary's County or programs like that, you know, where there's once again, that impediment to get there. And Dr. Neal, I'm coming back to you first. You know, I'm, that's a really good question. I, I don't, I don't know. And I, again, I get back to the expectations. I, I really feel my mother was a teacher. So, um, she saw with her white colleagues how students of color are, are treated different. My, my daughter was in STEM fourth and fifth grade and there were two people of color in the whole STEM group, but there was no you know, concerted effort to you know, keep her in there or, or push. I, I would have thought if, if you don't have lots of people of color that the teachers would have made some effort to make sure that you know, the people of color gauge their interests, you know, what can we do? And there isn't any of that. And I still come back to, if we don't have 
um, teachers that understand that because the teachers honestly can do a lot of damage to our people. And look, we send our kids to school for eight, 10 hours a day and somebody else is taking care of them. So if teachers don't have that understanding or if we can't somehow, you know, address that with school board, with, you know, teachers, I, I really feel that we are going to be at a disadvantage getting our little boys to those higher levels. How to do that? I don't, I don't know the answer. Maybe other panelists have the answer, but I really feel that we have to start before, you know, fourth and fifth grade with our boys. Anyone else? Magic bullet. Okay. If not, I, I since we've got, you know, kind of been on that um, not so happy stuff right now. What is it that, what is it that makes you go to work every day? What is it that really drove you to be a doctor? You know, Dr. Timu, you know, we kind of had that internal thing with you, but you were trying to run away from your legacy, but you mm -hmm. ended up falling back into your legacy. But what is it that, that drives you on a daily basis that, that makes you feel like this, this is it. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I wish there were other people that could have this feeling just like I did. I think uh, for me, at least, um, again, that personal drive is asking yourself, what do you want out of life? What makes you tick? And at the end of the day, I realized, okay, I like the sciences. At the end of the day, I said, I kind of like helping people, you know? And I said, okay, well, sciences, helping people. There you go, medicine. My mom had a knee replacement in uh, 2001, if I'm correct, 2001. And I saw the dramatic impact she had on her. And I said, wow, to be able to affect change in people in that way, you know, to, to, to women who I've seen my whole life in pain and to get rid of that pain with one procedure, that's a huge impact. And so then I asked myself again, when I die, who have I helped? That was me. And I said, well, if my job is helping people, with their health and I like the sciences and all these things, then what better career for me? So it, it took a lot of thinking and understanding before I got to that point. But, you know, I get so much, you know, I feel good inside. I wake up, like you said, because I ask myself those basic questions. And for me, that was the answer. Can that everybody's going to say that? Everybody's thinking that way. But my patients say, oh, you're, you're good. Thank you so much. You mean the world. I, I trust you and your opinion, all these things. I tell patients all the time that, especially with surgery, if I asked you to hand me your car keys for a day and take your car, you would say no. You'd look at me like I was crazy. But you trust me with your body. You trust me to do surgery. And that's a permanent mark that I put on you. I can't take it back. Once I use an incision, make an incision, I've left a permanent scar on you that's going to be there for the rest of your life. So it's a huge honor and privilege to be given that responsibility for somebody that looks like me, for somebody who comes and trusts me out of nowhere. Like I said, you wouldn't trust me with your car, but you trust me with your knee, with your shoulder, with your hip, and you're, you're expecting me to do the best job that I can possibly humanly do. So I, I, to me, again, that it's what makes you tick. And I think for the kids, and this, I told I have a lot of like nieces and nephews and not only my own kids, but anybody who I talk to, I said, ask yourself, what do you want out of life? What makes you tick? What are your, what are your thoughts? What's going to keep you up at night? And that will help kind of shift your goal. You know, like I said, if you, if you only care about money, okay, well, how are you going to get the money? <laughs> I mean, just be honest, you know, a lot of kids, uh, especially where I grew up at, the family was middle class. Everybody was doing well, but the kids sometimes did nothing. And I'm like, you're, you're living off your parents how are you going to have what your parents have? What, what are your goals in life? I'm not saying money should be a driving goal, but I'm definitely just saying that, you know, you have to ask yourself those questions because again, that dictates what you do. By first just asking a simple thing, what makes me tick? You know, and if, if basketball is what makes you tick, okay, how are you going to do it? But then uh, being realistic with yourself, because again, a lot of people aren't realistic that, you know, 
0.01% of people who go into basketball that actually make it <laughs> and have a career and, and be successful at it. So, you know, you, you have to kind of be honest with things and, and play your best. But like I said, I think for me, that, that was my answer. That's how I got to where I am today. And every time I go to operate, every time I do anything, that's literally what I think about. For every patient, I think about, you know, do the best I can for them uh, because you never know what's going on in their life. If I can be one good positive experience, then I've helped them. Even if I haven't treated their problem, but at least I was a positive part of the day, I've helped them. Yes. Yeah, that's really well said. Um, you know, um, sense of purpose is, uh, I think, a key um, driver um, for most um, healthcare professionals. And I would just say most professionals um, in, you know, in, in just in, to generalize. Um, and I think it's something that starts very, very early in development and it has to be nurtured. I think there are certainly folks who are more inclined to embrace that sort of sense of purpose, you know, like wanting to make a difference. But I think even with those who are inclined to, to, to sort of think, feel and think that way, I think it has to be nurtured. And so that is where uh, the community, the external environment becomes really, really important. You know, what, you know, what types of influences uh, do, do, do the children have uh, to begin to nurture that real sense of purpose? Um, you know, I think, um, I can't say for all physicians, but I would say most physicians, uh, that is an important reason why uh, we get up and do what we do day in and day out. And you know, for me, I almost feel like I've had two careers because I've fully transitioned into being a healthcare executive. And it's a, it's really a, a whole new set of skills <laughs> that you have to bring to the table. Uh, obviously, having, you know, your clinical background and clinical knowledge is an important part of it. But that sense of purpose is what, at least for me, drives me to want to, um, to do good you know, to influence, as, uh, as Dr. Antiomo mentioned, to influence um, people in a positive way, to have a positive impact on, on others. And uh, whether it's, you know, have, you know, doing good surgery and having a good outcome or helping them, um, you know, navigate a complex um, healthcare uh, encounter, uh, which can also be another huge challenge. Uh, but I think for children, um, that sense of purpose it's, it's there for most, but even when it's there, it has to be nurtured. Otherwise, it goes away. And if you don't have that sense of purpose, that drive to want to make a difference in the world, I think it becomes very, very difficult, uh, not only to get through, you know, the challenges of becoming a doctor, but really to be successful in society. In anything. Yeah. Sure. Dr. Davis, Dr. Neal, you can't hide on this one. No, I'm not hiding. I'm really enjoying what, what the two of them say. Because it is so true what they said about the character, your individual, your self-motivation, what drives you. All that is so true. And it just is bringing back all sorts of good memories for me. So I applaud what the two of them said, honestly. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Dr. Neil, our sh shining star? Uh, no, no, I, I agree. I absolutely, I absolutely agree. All right, what we're going to transition into is we have some questions from the audience, um, and we're going to go into that phase right now. Thank you so much for having this kind of like open chat and sharing with us. Um, I think it's very important that it gives that authentic voice to a very difficult topic. And thank you for sharing your experiences and giving us some ideas about how to address it. And I've got something down on my paper, and I'm going to have to get your contact information, at least you, those of your local so that we could uh, start upsetting the apple cart here and pulling some people together because now I got an idea going in my head. And as I said, my boss is going to hate me because she's going to ask me how much this is going to cost, you know, in, in the long run. But let's transition into our questions from the audience. And let's see here. One of the first questions that that we have is what specific ongoing programs are available in state colleges and universities near communities with large black populations that speak to the urgent need for black doctors in those communities? Who would like to take that one? Does anyone? 
I couldn't tell you. Uh, like, uh, as I said, my, my scholarship program is in uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, my home scholarship program. And it was geared towards getting minorities and, and di diversity into the sciences. It was not geared towards particular medicine or med school, but really, really, really focused on getting people into the sciences, getting PhDs, et cetera. And uh, so be it, I, it started out with the all black program for several years um, and then morphed into what it is today, but it's always been geared at getting minorities and, and women, you know, diversifying the, the, the scientific field. Uh, but it's, again, that started in college. You know, I, I couldn't tell you that there is something that I'm aware of that addresses it, and particularly in the medical field, and and particularly in those communities, because this, you know, that program was, uh, you know, admission based, where you're nominated and you you're, you're you get into that program. So it, it, I think that's a that's a great question, which I can't answer. Yeah. I guess we got to create something else there. We got some work ahead of us. Okay, we have a question that came in through the chat. Let me pull that up. All right, through our question. It goes back to when we were talking about the MCATs. You know, how can we evaluate medical medical school candidates if not um, via the standardized test or GPA? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so, you know, there are definitely alternative um, tools that you can uh, use to measure um, the probability, and it's always a probability. There's no way to know whether someone can successfully navigate a medical education and go on to becoming um, a really high quality uh, medical provider. Uh, but certainly um, academic Measuring academic performance is, is important because you have to be able to process a lot of information. There's, um, a, you have to have critical thinking capabilities. So invariably there is gonna be um, some uh, way, that, there has to be some way to measure that academic performance. And it's often uh, in uh, one's uh, performance in, in uh, secondary school uh, and additional um, academic um, activities. Uh, but beyond that, I think the real issue is how do we measure things like emotional intelligence and resilience and compassion? And there are tools to, to, to measure these things. They're probably not ideal, they're, but they're probably not perfect, but they could be helpful and they could be incorporated into an interview process. But I think the real important is, thing is looking at one's histo history. You know, um, your history can tell you so much about things like resilience and your um, commitment to community and your ability to embrace and see the value in diverse, being around diverse populations. Um, that is a really important story that often doesn't get incorporated into the decision uh, to admit someone into medical school. So I think there's, uh, it, it, the bottom line is I think it, it needs to be a package of different inputs um, that go way beyond measuring one's ability to take a standardized exam. Um, and then factoring that into, you know, you could put it into some kind of a ranking mecha scoring mechanism uh, or what have you, but um, it's definitely um, uh, important information that should always be factored into deciding uh, who, who gets into, into medical school. Yeah, that whole person, that whole yeah. person approach. Yep, that holistic approach, absolutely. I heard someone say, I don't want to measure academics, I want to measure achievement. They said, if you gave me someone who has a history, as you said, who's always trying, maybe failing, but always trying, and sometimes succeeding, we can always turn that person to a doctor. That's someone right. who scores 100% on every exam, they could be a doctor, but what kind of doctor are they going to be? We just don't know. So I just right. remember this talk I heard about achievement versus academics. So someone who's always... a trying to achieve, someone's always trying to be better, we can always turn that individual into a doctor. But how do you measure achievement? And that's what, that's what they're saying, we should start measuring achievements. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, it's funny, if you look at all the top med schools and top uh, residency programs, they all have great scores. 
So they don't look at scores, right? When you apply to Harvard, everybody, I am cat scored, not, and therefore they're they're already looking at what they have achieved. So you can essentially just say we're just not going to look at it. When I applied for orthopedics, everybody had a good step one, step two. There was so they had to look at other factors to decide how many people were going to be they were going to accept. And I think that's really the key. I mean, this, yeah, I mean, this test doesn't test. matter what your grade is. It, you know, like I said, if you look at all the top programs, the people that want to go to Yale, Harvard, Brown, all those schools, they're all going to have the highest of the high scores. But they're not going to say you all belong here. It has, I mean, I hope not. Otherwise, there's no point <laughs> even looking at the resume or the, the application. You're just going to say, all right, they have the highest uh, MCAT score. So there's something else that they're looking at. And that should be kind of the case for everywhere, you know, instead of, yes, you can't have a bunch of Fs and Cs and think you're going to, you know, do well. But at the same time, we're not going to put that much emphasis on the score, you know, that we're just going to look at the individual as a whole. And so exactly what have they achieved? What have they accomplished? And is it, you know, does it make sense? You know, does this person, like they can get the job done despite maybe having not the best score? Because I think that, that, as you said, the, the desire and the goal. If you have the desire and the goal, you will achieve it. It may take you longer, but I think you can do it. You know, there was a great story that they shared. I forgot the name of the physician. I think he ended up being an orthopedic uh, spine surgeon, I believe, uh, and talked about his history and coming uh, from an impoverished uh, family background, uh, yeah. a lot of uh, um, you know, dr uh, substance uh, uh, addiction, um, um, a lot of, um, um, you know, being a lot of criminal activity. I think both of his siblings uh, had uh, been in the um, criminal justice system. Uh, and, and then, um, you know, that, and, and also he struggled in terms of uh, his um, taking standardized exams, um, um, uh, you know, putting an application together. And it was just interesting to hear how he continued to, you know, persevere and also had a lot of um, internal support from family, from family members saying, look, you know, we need you to do this. Um, that was an important driver. But what I thought was interesting about his story and when he find, whoever finally uh, accepted him into medical school was, you know, he was not your prototype re you know, medical student who ends up becoming an or a orthopedic spine surgeon. You know, but it was just an amazing story of resilience and uh, really proud, proud that he uh, was successful. I, I, this is one of these questions, one of these statements that we can go on all night, but there's some, there's a lot of people in the QA that want, want to be able to get their questions across to us. I mean, so we, we got to make sure that we move on a little bit here. And Dr. Neal, this actually kind of go, goes to something that you kind of touched on with your with your nephew. So I'm, I'm going to start with you first, which would more of a focus on health education to include careers um, in health starting in elementary school help. So, you know, exposure more or less at, a, at an earlier age. I, I mean, I think there's... I don't even know if it needs to be exposure to health careers, but just exposures to um, people who are doing well. I'm not talking financially. I'm talking about being the the best. I mean, we have four African male doctors right here. We have a lawyer right here. You know, who's in the panel? <laughs> oh, excuse me, three. I can count three. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Please, I am not a Huxtable. I am not, you know, I'm not doctor and lawyer. So, you know, and, and, you know, a lawyer, which there are only two of you in the county of, of color. I so I think exposure, yes, is good. It doesn't specifically need to be healthcare related, though. But I think um, early on, Lexington Park, for instance, there are so many of those kids who don't have books in their home to to read. I mean, if you, uh, you know, now you come into kindergarten and people, you know, you, you, there's a wide, uh, you know, discrepancy. You have kids who can barely color, can't do their, you know, ABCs or whatever, and other kids who are, are reading. And obviously we know the kids who are reading what they've been exposed to in books at home. There's studies that talk about how many words children, you know, babies hear developing. 
And when you don't have that, you're behind the eight ball from the beginning. So yeah, I think exposure, but it doesn't have to be healthcare. It doesn't have to be to doctors. As you know, Dr. Davis said, you know, the, the gentleman that would ask him and question him, I mean, we need to expand people's, you know, horizons and kids' horizons about what is possible. I don't know anything about being an astronaut, but when I deliver these little babies, I say to them, oh, maybe you're going to be <laughs> to Mars. I, I do when I say, and the parents hear me saying that to these kids, I have expectations for your little baby that I just, you know, delivered. That's that's what we, we need. We need to have expectations of our young people, male, female, all people of color, but not, I don't feel healthcare specifically needs to be, you know, shown. Would anyone else like to tag? Because I, I think you wrapped that one right up in a, with a bow and and shot it off with a rocket to go along with your astronaut um, terminology there. Um, I, I think it is important of just the exposure of things outside of what you may be just see in general um, and realize that you can be this. I mean, it's one of these questions that we debate all the time, like when we talk you know, now and again about, you know, when we talk desegregation is what's one of the one of the best things is that you can live in everywhere but what's one of the bad things that occurred is that you no longer have that exposure in the neighborhood to that doctor that teacher that lawyer who because of you know being forced to be in the neighborhood or be in this section of town you got to see on a daily basis and even if your parents were the auto mechanic or you know or the person who was you know, working out in the fields. There was someone that you could look at that could take you under your wing as a mentor that could be living right next door to you. And sometimes we forget that sometimes, you know, that we have to go back and give back to in order to help bring up, so. And, you know, and I just thought of a, of a story, you know, when I was in first grade, my parents put me in ballet and there were no other people, you know, of, of color and I really, I felt the weight of that, you know, that I didn't know how to verbalize that I just stuck out. There were no other people. My teacher, um, she gave me a picture of a dancer from the um, dance school of Harlem, the ballet school in Harlem. And I had never, I didn't even dawn on me that there were African American who, who like dance like that. No clue. To this day, 50 years later, I still have that picture she gave me. But just the thought that that didn't even occur to me that that was not possible. And my, I, my mouth fell open when she gave it to me because I was like, there's somebody that looks like me on point. Never thought that. So it, to my point that it doesn't need to be healthcare, but they just need to be exposed. Correct. I would say exposure on a large scale too. Um, by that, I mean variety, but also numbers. There is strength in numbers. If you see one successful African-American, it may be an isolated event. You see 10 or 15 of them. And, they, and from all different backgrounds, it looks like a crowd that you potentially could fit into. You understand? I had a young patient tell me they're making videos on YouTube and, and say, oh, you can get paid for it. I said, how many people make videos on YouTube? Millions. Hundreds of millions of people. How many of them are making money? One or two. So your odds of making money off of this are very, very low. Okay? If a lot of people are doing it and making money, then I can see you doing it. But don't, you know, bet your life that this is going to be your living. Again, strength in numbers. If you see a lot of people who are successful, who are minorities, who are doing things in, in, in many aspects, you know, I'm always enamored when I see people who are very successful in a lot of different pathways because it's not what I grew up with. I grew up with medicine. My parents literally told me, I can't advise you on anything else, but we know medicine and it will, it will, <laughs> you will succeed in that. But there's so many people who, who do so many different things who are successful. So I encourage everybody to go out there and explore. But again, if you have that number, like that's, that's why med school mattered a lot for me because I went to Morehouse School of Medicine. And yes, it was not all black, but there were more than one black people there. There was a lot of minorities there, you know, and that made me feel fit in. And again, it's different if there's two out of 100 versus 20 out of 100, you know, you, you find similarity, strength in numbers. So large scale exposure with numerous people makes you makes it more of a reality. You know, and, uh, he's just not isolated. Oh no, it is possible. Look, there's like 10 people just like me who've done it in a variety of ways. Wow. 
it, it seems like we're, we're having a call and you, you know, you said something earlier that, you know, sometimes some, you know, God works in mysterious ways. So I, I think we have been blessed by some work that we all got to do after we had done here, because the work doesn't stop with this conversation. The next step is what now and how now? And I give that to you, you know, what now and how now, you know, how, how do we move into that next phase? How do we make this happen? How do we, how do we start changing um, all these steps? Cause you know, in the movie they have, they have their program. That's great for them, but what do we do here? How do we make a change within our own community so that we have that pipeline of individuals into those different jobs or those different experiences? Well, I think one logical thing that um, I thought about when um, um, I was going to join this group earlier on is that I see a lot of school teachers in my office and a practical thing that can be done is zoom in in the classrooms because that's where it really begins. Um, the conversations are easy. They'd be very relaxed with like um, middle school kids and it's simply just engaging them because that's where it starts. So that's a practical thing we can do. It's easy to do. We take off time during the day, you know, half an hour, an hour, and we just talk to the kids in, in the classroom without actually having to be in the classroom. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing that the pandemic has given us is, is a different way of seeing the world and doing things. So, and it's easy enough to learn that way. Um, there, we have a question here. Let me get back to it. Because I'm going through, I'm toggling between um, two different screens. How might the US Congress best support an increase um, by Bach representation in, in STEM or STEAM, you know, if we add in the arts. So <laughs> blank checkbook, we can get them to do anything. How do we get Congress to really see this as a crisis as we know that it is? How do we get them to, you know, to act upon it? What can they do for us? To, to bring in and diversify um, our, medical, our medical field or a lot of other fields too, but let's start with the medical field. How do we, how do, how do we get Congress more involved in getting BIPOC population into the STEM, the STEM related fields? It just, I'm sort of pessimistic on that answer. <laughs> I, I know it can be done because I grew up, and again, I don't want to show my age, I grew up in the space age and uh, Congress put a lot of money into trying to put a man on the moon without hesitation. And people were not ashamed to say, I want to grow up, not necessarily be an astronaut. I want to grow up to be a scientist. So how do we get Congress in that mindset of what happened back in the sixties and, you know, the uh, really the sixties. And I just don't know, looking at the attitude that I've seen coming out of Congress concerning um, statements said about teachers and so on and so forth. You know, it's interesting. They may say things like that, but everybody knows they, they love their teacher. They'll reflect upon what happened, as you heard Dr. Neal said, about what happened to her in ballet, you know. So I, I just don't know how to get that thinking to come around. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Dr. Davis. Um, you know, obviously our legislature has the ability to influence medical schools directly through various funding mechanisms. Um, but the, the challenge is, you know, whether or not there's that will to do that, whether there's enough of a collective will for our Congress to, 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 to take that up as a, as a charge. And, I, and I'm not very optimistic about it as well. I think this has got to be more of a grass, grassroots type of activity. And I think, uh, Kelsey, you mentioned that, um, you know, you know, starting with the basics, you know, for example, in our communities, you know, you know, where are the people of color and, um, and do they have access to, to medical professionals and to other professionals? And um, you, you, you mentioned this about, um, I think it was uh, Dr. Timo about uh, Zoom. And oh, no, actually it was, it was Namdi, you mentioned it about Zoom. I mean, it is so easy 
to go into a classroom now. And I mean, yeah, would it be better if you were physically in there and you could interact more directly with the kids? Sure. But I think that, you know, remote access into the schools um, could be very powerful. At least you could have dialogue. They could see you. You could have conversations. And to be honest, you know, our young folks probably are becoming more comfortable in this virtual space than we are, <laughs> at least than I am, you know, but, but so I, I think that it's a, it's a grassroots approach is probably going to be more practical. And, and I think it can have significant impact. Would anyone else like to answer that question? Because we just had another one come in in the chat. For those of you that work local, or just period, um, does NetStar have a mentoring program that can be offered here in St. Mary's? It would be new to me. <laughs> I don't. I haven't heard of one, but it's something that I would love to be a part of maybe help start or something just because uh, that exposure is key. As uh, Dr. Davis mentioned, just even Zoom into uh, classrooms. I think the school is the easiest way, mainly because most kids are gonna be in school, elementary kids, you know, they're gonna be in school in some way or form at some point in time. And that's the easiest way to at least for them to see you repeatedly, hopefully once a month and once every couple months, just to keep, seeing you and checking in and et cetera. I think hopefully that does something to them to let them know, because even if they're coming from a bad neighborhood, that it um, helps provide exposure that there's a way out, there's another path. You don't have to stay in the current trajectory that you think you may be in. Of course, a, a, a small child doesn't think that way, but again, the more you see it, the more you possibly will believe it and make it happen. So. I, I'm not aware of a mentoring program by MedStar, but um, it's something that would be helpful. Yeah, so so they uh, MedStar has um, different programs um, for um, uh, high school students, uh, secondary school students. Um, uh, the one that uh, comes to mind is the um, MedStar Research Institute annually has a two or three week observership where uh, they invite stu uh, students um, to uh, shadow researchers. Uh, I'm not aware of a program that involves um, shadowing clinical uh, providers, uh, but uh, it's certainly something we should explore. Um, MedStar Health uh, has, is in the process of rolling out a, a, di a, di a diversity uh, strategy uh, that um, we're really excited about. And, um, and I hope that um, mentoring will be, um, will be part of that, that strategy. Um, so it's certainly something we can explore. Sounds great. And it sounds like a great opportunity. Um, it'll be interesting to see, to see, you know, if it does come to fruition and if it trickles down into, you know, Southern, into St. Mary's County and to see how, how that will operate. Um, would anyone else like to say anything on that about possibly if MedStar doesn't start in one? And yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think there are enough people in the county um, interested. If uh, Miss Janice Walthar with the NAACP, um, Mary Washington with the Board of Education, very involved in the school. So I think putting the right people together to do something, you know, talking about zooming into school. I think that, you know, Ms. Washington would be the person to talk to, to kind of, okay, how do we set that up? How do we get that going? We have the people who are interested, stated that they'd be interested in doing that. It's just, the, how do we get that going? So I think talking to Ms. Walthar with the NAACP, who probably can make some things happen, Ms. Washington with the Board of Education would probably be, um, you know, the people to talk to, to really get something started. Well, it's funny because that was actually Dr. Wallfauer's question about the mentoring. So she's watching us right now and everything we keep saying, you know what's going to happen. We're, we're all going to get emails and she's going to put us to work. So that because that's just the way she does things. Um, and kind of dovetailing, have, how often um, have you been invited to possibly invited to be 
speak to our public schools, you know, or any school, actually, elementary, middle or high school. Um, does that happen often for you? Uh, I haven't um, my, myself. Like I could say, Dr. Uh, Miss um, Washington, we, we talk about what's going on in the schools frequently, but beyond that, nothing formal. We were talking about, um, you know, examples for young girls and, and things like that, but nothing formal. Um, and also, I, I think there's been a lot of talk, um, but we haven't, you know, made any any plans or done anything concrete. I don't know if any of the other panelists have been approached, but I, I haven't. So for me, not, not in St. Mary's County, um, but certainly um, uh, in when, when I was practicing in, uh, in the district, um, lots of work in the community there, um, both in school settings, um, also in um, other community settings, working with young men, um, on men's health issues. Prostate cancer was one of my areas of expertise. And so a lot of um, community outreach related to that. But I'll be honest, my most um, gratifying uh, school session was with my 11-year-old uh, daughter uh, when they invited me to her class uh, on Parents' Day and uh, got to talk to the kids about, you know, being a doctor and being um, also being an administrator. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, it's, it's very gratifying when you get to do that kind of work. That is, that, that is wonderful, you know, just watching the eyes open up to that new experience of the different things. That, and you never realize how important your job is until you start talking to young people and you see them look and go, wow, I wish I could do something like that. So you, you never know who you may have touched in that room that may have gone on to do other things. And that's always that, that appreciative thing that, that, you know, all of us, when you're selfless and you just do it out of the goodness of your heart. And just because it's the right thing to do, you know, you set that path for other people to follow, to follow through. Um, got a quick question. How would you define success as it pertains to increasing the number of black men in the medical field? How would that, what does that look like? Wow, tough question. You want, well, you want to take I, a stab I, at it, Dr. Davis? <laughs> no, it's, it's a tough question. I, I never thought about that. I never really I mean, thought about the question of yeah. like, where is the finish line? That's what he's sort of yeah. saying. Yeah. We've achieved the, uh, we've gotten to the finish line. I just never thought about that. But, you know, but, one, I think one outcome would definitely be around um, reducing healthcare disparities, uh, because I do think that there is a connection between um, healthcare disparity outcomes, uh, uh, clinical outcomes disparities among different populations, and and having um, um, a diverse um, healthcare delivery community. Um, to, to, to care for those folks. Um, you know, as someone, as I mentioned, who um, uh, uh, cared for many men with prostate cancer in the African-American community, um, I can tell you just numerous times when uh, uh, some of my patients will say, hey, look, doc, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I don't know that I could have this conversation with someone who wasn't my color. Um, whether it's about complications of potential complications of treatment, um, you know, or, um, or more, you know, um, life expectancy, all those difficult, sensitive questions. Uh, and and it's, some of it is, and it's not about knowledge, it's about sort of the experience, the life experience, and the gestures and the, you know, those subtle things that um, often um, uh, uh, you can't define when you're interacting with someone. Uh, so I think that as we get more uh, people of color, caring for people of color, I suspect that um, it will impact on our healthcare outcomes for sure. And, and it's, it's interesting that you say that because inside, inside Higher Education Today I actually had an article talking about how sort of the dismantling of the, um, the teaching methods used when it has come to specifically African-Americans and sort of the 
getting into the whole aspect of, you know, um, look, how do you look at race in the sense of when it comes to teaching, you know, in, in the, not understanding as a construct, but, you know, that some schools still teach it as, as, a, as a biological reality. And um, it was just really interesting and kind of fitting because it was like, oh, wow, well, you know, I'm going to be doing a talk this evening. And here's this whole entire thing about talking about just how many med schools are really attacking that issue to equip not just African-American doctors, but every doctor at looking at African-Americans in a different way. Yeah. And in more or less in the same way that you would your other patients. So yeah. if, you, if you're... It, I'll try to get that link out to you so that you're able able to take a quick read. It's a, about a five minute read, if that. Yeah. So. And, and, and I definitely want to qualify by saying that you know healthcare disparities is much more complicated than just having more minority care providers. That's I right. mean, there's a lot that goes into that, but um, it is, I think, one of the pieces of the puzzle for sure. We have about three minutes left, and, and I want to get what your final takeaways are from the film and our discussions. And we've already talked about what we can do, but what will we, what can, not just what we can do, but what will you do to help change this going forward? So let's put a little more of a positive spin on that. So who would like to start to go first? What are your final thoughts? about the film, the discussion, and what it, what's going to be your charge from this point forward? I know I'm pretty honest. Speaking on for me, personally speaking for me, I think, uh, again, great film that honestly I, I had watched kind of like it was going to be a chore, to be honest, just because I was, I know it was on this panel, I wanted to watch the film, make sure I was ready, prepared. But I was enthralled with the film. You know, I watched it and I started thinking about the problems. And I said, man, you know, I know it existed, but I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it and how I could impact it. So uh, I just, you know, I watched it twice and I was like, this is really, really good. And I've been sharing it with other people and probably going to watch it a third time because I just like the points that were made. And, and it, like uh, Davidson mentioned, it brought up memories about my own upbringing and how I got to where I am today. And uh, moving forward, at least for me, I think it's just being more visible. I mean, I think all of us can share the experience that so many people are proud to see us as professionals. You know, I get it all the time. Patient drove two hours just to see me. <laughs> Literally just me. I heard you the best. I'm coming to see you. That's it. And, um, you know, it's, it's an honor. It's a pleasure. But it puts the stakes that much higher in terms of the work that I do ability and what I do. So I think at least, uh, as I said, for me, just instilling, uh, you know, that desire and goal in some mind out there, if I can, to, to be better, to work hard, you know, to, to your name's attached to it, be the best person you can be, no matter what you do, what area. Uh, that's the, what I've always told, like, my, my siblings and my, not my siblings, but my nephews and nieces, and even my kids. And, like, you don't have to be a doctor. Whatever you do, do it well, very well. You know, I don't care what it is. Just do it well. Be successful and be the best at it. And make sure you're happy, you know. So personal drive, finding what, what you want to do, what you want to get out of life, and then working towards that goal and trying to succeed in that goal. So I think for me, just, again, trying to do more outreach, trying to be more visible and uh, have a further impact on other people would be, uh, particularly young minds would hopefully be something that I, I can do in the future. Thank you. Who's... So real quick for me, one thing that, um, one very tangible thing I, I'm definitely going to do is I'm going to um, hopefully get my 15-year-old son to watch the movie with me. I think um, he would probably there would be a lot that would resonate for him. Uh, but, you know, 15 year olds, you just never know. But um, I do think it's something that, um, you know, young, young men, young black men should really um, get the opportunity to, to see that movie. I think it could really make a difference for a lot of folks. Okay. Dr. Davis? I would say that um, 
nowadays being a physician has a lot of obstacles, a lot of hurdles. It's a very difficult thing. But I continue to be hopeful that I can make a difference. Um, hopeful in the sense that I think about all the people who helped me get to where I am right now. And I just think that if I can continue to work hard in the office of doing my form of mentoring, I can make a difference. And I feel very, very optimistic about that. And um, I've seen tangible proof of that. So yes, I would love to participate more with these type of outreaches, outreach, but um, I'm optimistic that what I'm doing right now is working to some degree. And Dr. Davis, or Dr. Neal, excuse me. <laughs> see, right. now, it's see, late at night. Now, now Dr. Neal, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing you now. So, right. you know, the, the little trade-off. We, we saved the best for last. The best for last. No, I, I'm, I'm so glad to have seen the film. First of all, uh, I'm glad to have seen three, one, two, three, three right, right. male physicians, African American, because that doesn't happen all in a group all at one time. So um, I was glad to see the film to really be cognizant that this is a problem. And I, I'm going to continue to um, do the best work that I can do. Hopefully, people see me doing that and that means something. And I'm gonna make darn sure that my nephew not only succeeds in high school, but gets into medical school, finishes residency and is successful. I'm gonna absolutely make sure that that happens. And remember, you've got the best doctor that people drive two hours for that could potentially mentor him right in, right, right in the same county. So <laughs> I think we got something working here. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, once again, just once to, again. Oh, oh, sorry, please, Michael. Please, I was just going to tell them thank you because oh, I, have enjoyed, please I have enjoyed. Do, this please time. do, yeah. Uh, I have enjoyed and I'm going to say thank you to you in a minute, but go ahead. I have enjoyed this immensely, and I appreciate all the hard work you do, not just you know being here tonight, but on a daily basis. Because the thing is, you are effectuating change in people's lives in a multitude of ways, be it bringing them into life, be it them continuing life be it them now living their best life because they're without pain. Your hands are gifts. Your minds have, have, have soared, but your hearts are even larger. And we are blessed to have you here tonight and part of our community and our lives. So I thank you so much for sharing some time with me and for all of us. So I appreciate it. Thanks for you because you just said, something that's impossible for me to follow. Um, well said, sir. Um, a quick thanks to our partners, and I'd like to thank three people in particular here. Um, from Partners in Dismantling Racism and Privilege, I see Diane Davies here. Thank you for your support for this program. Uh, from Historic Soderly, uh, Nancy Easterling, thank you so much for your support for this program in the library. Um, NAACP 7025 here in St. Mary's County, Janice Walthauer, one of my bosses. Um, and thank you to the doctors because you have really made me look good. I'm going to bask in your reflective glory. Um, thank you to Sarah Stevenson and Laura Vrenchesri who did all the work putting this program together and I just get to look good again. It was a great gig if you can get it. Um, thank you doctors. Earlier this evening, the, the phrase, if you can see it, you can be it was used. You have been here. People have seen you. Thank you for setting such an incredibly wonderful example in our community and for all you're doing. And as Kelsey said so much more eloquently than I do, being the ones that young people can see and try to be. Um, Kelsey, thank you so much for being here this evening. I want to thank you for something that happened several years back when. Uh, representing the library. I was getting beat up by certain elements in the community and you saw me on the street one day and you just said, you're right, be strong. You have no idea how much that meant to me and how much easier it made to get through some really bad stuff here at the library was. So thank you for being a real pillar in the community and for all you do. Thanks everybody for joining us this evening. And it's been a great program. I, I enjoyed so much seeing it. You were inspiring, thank you.